happened to go back there. I really had not uh, necessarily planned on doing that, but uh, the closer I got to the end of the week, the more I felt impressed that I should go back to Matthew 6 and 33 and uh, point out some things that I did not get to last week. I got to the first part of it, some very important stuff, but I didn't, uh, I, I didn't give you everything that I feel like the Holy Spirit had given me uh, built around this verse. So look at it. But seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Okay, say hallelujah for the word. There are four things that stand out in that singular verse of Scripture. I've already brought to your attention two of them, but the first one I've got to go back to uh, because the Lord just kind of built on it uh, a little bit this week, so I want to go back and deal with the, the first part of that verse, and then I'll take you to where we were last week, all righty? First of all, I want to deal with priorities. Everybody say priorities. Now say first things first. Okay. I want that, if, if nothing else locks into your spirit uh, out of this sermon, I want that to lock in. I want priorities and I want first things first just to get locked in to your spirit this morning. Okay, now notice something that I've already pointed out. Now, first of all, this verse of Scripture says, Seek you first. Okay, all right. Here is a precedent being set. God is going to say, this is what has got to be number one. Not second, not third, but God is saying, this is what you've got to do. Now, when, when, when I tell you to do something, you can question it. There, there's no, no problem with that. Okay, but when God says do something, guess what? You don't question that. When God's Word says, this is what I want you to do, or this is what you're to do, then what God has done is God has, has laid out a group of priorities, so he said, seek first, and I want to I deal with that for just a little while. I've already dealt with it some, but I felt in my spirit that I need to go back. The word first comes from the Greek word proton, which comes from the word protos, okay? Now, the reason I'm doing that is because I want you to, to get the magnitude of how God views priorities. The word first defined means uh, something that is leading, something that is foremost, something that is prominent, and then most important means first in time, place, order, and importance. So what has God done? God has said, okay, I want to lay you out what is the most important things for you to seek in this life. Now, if I went through this crowd to every individual and said to you, what do you consider the most important thing in your life? I guarantee you, we'd have many, many different opinions. To some of you, your house is most important. To some of you, husbands, your wife is the most important and should be, all right? To you wives, your husband. So, you know, and on down the line, your children. To some of you, especially in uh, November, hunting is most important because that's how you put food on the table, okay? So hunting becomes very important. If you happen to own a business, then your business is your priority. Uh, you know, and, and a job, your job, because it's your way of making a living. And so on and on goes the list of what you consider the most important thing in your life. Well, you know what? God wanted to help you out here. God wanted to add some clarity. And so God 
spoke or Jesus spoke and said, I want to tell you what I want you to put first and foremost, or I want to give you some priorities. I want to look at the word or the subject of priorities just a little bit. You see, the word indicates and points out the value of having a priority system. Life is not just something you can kind of live it willy-nilly, go do what you want to, say what you want to, pray when you want to, show up in church when you want to, pick up the Bible when you want to. Now, you may do that, but you're not in line with the Word of God. Thank you. That seems like that went over real well. Hallelujah. Okay. I mean, none of that it lines up with the Word of God. And in all of it has value. Lord knows my wife is valuable to me, okay? My, my sons are, my grandkids are. Uh, you know, what I do for a living, that holds, uh, that holds value to me. But yet, I need to understand what really holds value in God's eyes. I've got to come up with a system of priorities here. Exactly what does God consider, number one, number two, number three, and, and on and on goes the priority now. I got to thinking about uh, discarded priorities. You see, most of the time when you get saved, church is number one with you. That, that most always works that way. When you first find the Lord, God becomes number one with you. But somewhere down the road of life, all of a sudden, God becomes almost an afterthought. Church is what you do when you don't have anything else to do. It ceases to be a priority. Praying, studying, all of that. We want the benefit of it, but we don't want to do any of the labor that is required to get it. Everybody, not everybody, many people in our society today are wanting handouts. They want something without doing anything to get, okay, what they want. The mentality has been developed, you owe me. And because you owe me, because of what you did to me, you've got to give it to me. May I stand before you today and tell you that God doesn't owe you anything. All right? It doesn't work that way. It's the other way around. But I, I don't want to go, if I, if I go there, I'm not going to get to where I, I, I feel like I need to get to. But you got to understand that. I began to think about discarded priorities. And there was one man whose life stood out that I consider a man that discarded priorities. It's going to kind of surprise you because of what the scripture says about him later on. But that young man had a tremendous beginning. His end was not too bad, but it was everything that went on in between that shows us to where he discarded priorities. That man was and is King David. David messed up. Everybody say, David messed up. Now, if you know anything about David, you know he had a, a, a pretty good beginning. You see, David, first of all, was a shepherd boy who heard from God while in his times of solitude. You see, David spent a lot of time with sheep. And during the downtime, uh, when, when he wouldn't have to watch after them while they're grazing, maybe he's put them up for the night. He had a lot of downtime. And in those times of solitude, uh, David did a lot of writing. David heard from God. God uh, as a shepherd. Let me throw something at you real quick. And, and some the Holy Spirit just spoke to me a moment ago, or I felt spirit to spirit. Get this. Most of the time, you won't hear from God uh, in the middle of a bunch of noise. Huh? God will not compete with your turmoil. Because most of the time, we bring our own turmoil on. It's not God. Most of us have got so busy and are, are so used to noise until we're not comfortable if it's not noisy around us. The television's got to be up real loud. 
Have you ever noticed the moment you walk in the house, you turn the TV on? Have you noticed the moment you walk in, you turn the radio on? The moment you walk in, you've got to have noise around you. You're so used to noise until if it ever gets quiet, you get nervous. Huh? I, you say, I'm not like that. I know people that are so used to noise until they're not comfortable unless there's noise going on. Oh, I can't sit here like this. I've got to turn something on. I've got to have some noise. But get this, most of your revelation, most of your direction will come in your solitude. David heard from God in solitude. So his beginning was he heard from God. He could hear from God. He's a teenager. He's not even 15 years old. He's already getting all of these songs uh, that you and I depend on to bring us out of our rough times. Not only did he hear words, uh, you know, that benefited him, uh, but he shared those words uh, and they brought strength to the multitudes uh, as they're still doing today. David uh, was a boy slash man uh, with revelation knowledge and exemplary faith. You see, David was the boy that came out on a battlefield when a giant was coming against Israel and the soldiers who had been trained in warfare were operating in fear, but this boy steps out on the battlefield, hears the giant and says, who does he think he is? Doesn't he know we serve the living God? So what am I saying? He started out getting word from God. He started out with revelation knowledge. He knew what others should have known, but did not. So, great beginning. Not only was David known for that, but David, as we know, was a giant slayer. Look at somebody and say, God wants you to be a giant slayer. Huh? <laughs> glory, glory. I, I like that. Praise God. I believe there's some giant slayers sitting right out in this congregation this morning. Can I say that again? Some of y'all are going, I don't know about that. Hallelujah. I want you to say, I'm a giant slayer. Okay, okay. Glory, glory. Some of y'all got some giants and showed up on your house, showed up in your family. It's time you got your slingshot out. It's time you said to the devil, don't you know who I am? Don't you know what God I serve? Don't you know what is alive inside of me? Don't you know about my anointing? Don't you know about my king? Don't you know, oh, 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 I'm a giant slayer. I'm not a quitter. I'm not a runner. I'm not backing off, backing away, backing down. I know who I am and I'm sticking. Sometimes if you're not careful, you get distracted by words. You get distracted by what someone says or what goes on in your life. And you get to majoring on the negativity of life instead of the positives of life. In other words, you get to majoring on what the devil's doing or what you're doing instead of majoring on what God's doing. Guess whose side you decided to live on? You decided to live on your side, not God's side. I'd rather listen to what God says. God said, listen, boy, you can do all things through Jesus Christ. Now, you know what I've got to do? When the battle gets hot, I've got to dwell on what God said I could do, not on what someone's trying to do to me. I've got to believe in me. I, you know what? I've got to believe in me before I believe in you. Now, first, I believe in God. But if I don't believe in me, I'm going to sit home when I'm feeling bad. I'm going, to, I'm going to roll over and play dead. I'm going to act like a possum. All right. Isn't that the animal that when you attacked him, he rolls up in a, in a ball? He plays possum. We got a lot of possums in the church today. When the devil comes after them, they roll up and play dead. Not me, uh-uh. I'm kind of that, uh, I'm more, I, I want to have that bulldog mentality. You come after me, the hair stands up on my back. I show my teeth and say, come on. Ah. 
Amen. It's time we got a bulldog mentality with the devil. And guess what? One type of bulldog, once he lays his, his chops on you, he don't turn loose of you. You got to pry his teeth out of you. What am I saying? I'm saying, church, uh, don't pay attention to the devil. Don't pay attention to the words coming out of other people. Stand on what they say of God. You're anointed. You're an overcomer. You're called of God. It doesn't matter what anyone else says, you hang on to that. Give the Lord a hand clap. That's the way it is. You see, David had all that going for him. He, he, was, he was smart in those areas. He was an anointed singer. I like this part. Saul, who was full of a devil, needed somebody now I could go, I could take, tell you Saul's life story too. He was anointed, ended up being a great king, but then he got to depending on things he shouldn't depend on and lost his anointing. So he ended up with a demon. So they started looking for someone that could play some music to calm that thing down. Guess what? David, the one that had got revelation in solitude, uh, was called off of the sheepfold field, brought into Saul's house. And when that old demon would start acting up, then, then David, David would start playing and singing and demons and devils would have to get out of the house because God anointed the vessel that was doing the singing. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? All of you worship people around here, you ought to have so much of God in you that when you step foot onto this platform and you stand up here and begin to sing, you need to understand something. God wants to give you an anointing uh, that will cause the devil to run out these doors uh, and then when I step up here on the platform I don't have to fight the devils you've already ran off uh, I can just start operating uh, in revelation knowledge uh, because that's God's way and that's God's will you make it a lot easier for me if you get the devil out before I get up here all right well, when I got to get up here and do your job it really takes a lot of my energy. But I appreciate our worship people and, and their anointing that is on their life. I used to tell my team that traveled with me all over the country when we were doing a lot of singing and preaching together as a team, I'd say, listen, listen, it don't matter what goes on outside. It doesn't matter what kind of battles you go through. When your foot hits the platform, you're stepping into an area of trust. God is saying, I trust you enough to take you off of a pew put you on the platform and let you lead people into my presence. If you ever do anything to break God's trust, stay off the platform. I think preachers need to learn that too. Okay, we won't go there. This is not a preacher's conference, is it? But we need to understand. So David had so much of God's anointing on him. And, and the reason I'm spending a little bit of extra time on this is I want you to see what David was prior to, you see. Before he got his priorities mixed up, okay. He was anointed. He received revelation. He was a giant killer. He knew who, who, who he was in God. He knew what was going alive on the inside of him. David knew he was a great warrior. You remember them singing? The ladies would get to singing. and They would say Saul killed his thousands, but David killed his tens of thousands. He was a greater warrior to the man, than the man that had been taught how to be a warrior, okay? So he was, he was a great warrior. All I'm trying to do is to show you, show you David prior to the forsaking of priorities. But I want to say something. It doesn't matter how great you were. What really matters is how great you are. Huh? It's not what you've done. It's what you're doing. This is what the, the Holy Spirit keeps saying to me in this, this, this that I'm going through right now, to where I'm seeking, I, I want more of God's presence. I want to become more aware of the God that is in me. I don't want to focus on John Rhodes. I don't want to focus on what I am. I, I'm a pastor. I, I, I operate in this or that. Uh-uh. I just want to draw close to, the, to Jesus. I, I, I want it to be about him. I don't want it to be about me. I don't want to build a congregation because it's about my preaching or it's about my teaching. I want it to be about Jesus. Pull the man out of the picture and if it's built on Jesus, uh, it's going to keep going and growing uh, because everything depends on Jesus. So it's not your past that is going to be productive. It's your present. Where are you right now? 
And don't feed me this stuff where you just don't know what I'm going through. Get this. We all go through stuff. But we all get through stuff. Don't magnify the stuff. Magnify Jesus. That's what it's all about. And please don't, don't think I'm being rude and don't understand. I understand. But, but I'm just seeing some things in the Spirit to where our focus is so off. It's just so off. We can be up one moment and flat on our face the next morning. And, and, and we wonder why. It's because our focus is off. It's on us. And this is where David messed up. He got his priorities. And, and, I, and I love David. I love his writings. I love to read about him. I understand that, that his heritage and what, what he did literally went on. And, uh, and, and if you really get to studying the prophets and get to study uh, uh, Israel, you'll find out that everything was compared to David. David's kingdom, it was all compared to David. But notice, the scripture that jumped out at me years ago that let me know that David messed up. It happened. This is 2 Samuel 11 and 1, and, and I don't know. Yeah, he's got it up there. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent. Everybody say David sent. Now, that was his first mistake, and I'll show you why in just a moment, and then we're going somewhere else. Okay, the David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. Now, his first mistake is instead of going with them, he sent someone else in his place. Now, now, now get what I'm about to say here. No one can take your place. You can't send someone in your place because you don't want to do it. You can't send someone in your place because you don't understand it. You can't send someone in your place because you're afraid. You can't send someone in your place because your feelings are hurt. No one can take your place. No one can take my place. Not in my relationship with God. Okay. David sent someone and, they, and, and let them take uh, his place. Why am I saying that? Because a king didn't sit home on a throne during this time. A king, a warrior king especially, was always in the front line of the battle. Okay? So David chose, and here, here let, let, let's read the rest of it. Let's read the rest of it. Now then, he sent Joab. They destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. Now when I saw that, that blessed me. That blessed me. In other words, though David sent someone in his place, let me go ahead and read the last part. But David remained at Jerusalem, or in modern vernacular, David chose to stay home. Huh? David chose to stay home. I want you to get that in your spirit because that's where David threw out his priorities. Here this great warrior, here this great worshiper, here this great man of revelation should have been in the front of the battle but he chose to stay home instead of going to battle. Now, now what blessed me, all right, was not what David did, but what happened in spite of David. Get this now. They destroyed the people of Ammon, their enemy. They destroyed Rabbach, their enemy, all right. David should have been leading in the destruction. He chose to stay home, but God had a will. God had a plan. God's will, God's plan was for his warring king to be leading and not staying at home. But when he chose to remain where he should not be, it did not stop the plan of God from being successful and going on. So guess what? God's kingdom did not suffer defeat because somebody decided to stay home that should have been what I'm a saying, God's kingdom will win with or without me. I need God more than God needs me. Mm -mm -mm. Are y'all getting this? All right. Priorities. Now, now, God's kingdom went forward. But let's notice something real quick. Hang with me. Just hang with me. David started on a downhill spiral. When he stayed home, you know the story. He's out on his back veranda, looks over into his neighbor's backyard. Guess what? His neighbor's wife is taking a bath out 
in her backyard or back porch or veranda or whatever. I can never quite figure that one out other than it was a setup of the devil. All right, because David was in a weak time. This woman is taking a bath. She is naked to where this man can look over and see her. Why would she have done that without ulterior motives herself? Okay, but we won't go there, will we? Okay, but David sees Bathsheba, and the moment he sees her, a spirit of lust took over. And David began to want another man's wife. Now, what started it? What set David up? Okay, you say, well, if it hadn't have been in him, he would have never lust after her to begin with. Okay, believe that if you want to. It's irrelevant to me. What, to me, what I saw and I, I, I continue to see is that if David had have been where he should have been, he'd have never been in a place to be tempted by what he should not have been tempted with. And what I want you to see as God lays out priorities and says seek first, he's telling us this is what you've got to put first. And if you put anything ahead of this, then more than likely you're going to end up with a Bathsheba in your life. Huh? It may not be a woman you lust after. It may be something you drink, something you smoke, some, something else that overrides uh, the value of being, putting God first. If David had have been where he should have been, he would not have had that mentality to desire another man's wife. So he ended up stepping in the wrong way. Now get this, God gave him opportunities to step out of it. But what we see at the loss of priorities was that he called for Uriah's wife Bathsheba. She came to him. He then knew her, committed adultery. Then uh, she became pregnant with his child. Uh, and to cover that up, uh, he sends Uriah to the front of battle knowing he's going to be killed. Uh, get this, adultery was caused by a loss of priorities. Uh, the the the, the pregnancy out of his wedlock was because of a loss of priorities. Murder of one of his trusted captains was because of a loss of priorities. Get this, get this. The baby dies and did not live. Later on, David's son rapes David's daughter. Later on, another son kills the son that rapes the daughter. Later on, another son says I want the kingdom uh, and tries to kill David uh, and has killed himself why did it happen uh, because David got his priorities uh, mixed up mixed up mixed up uh, come on come on come on clout 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 right there say pastor 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 this is not encouraging me <laughs> Do you know that sometimes your pastor has to look you in the eye and say to you, you're messing up? And if you don't get it together, spirits are going to come into your life that will cause you to do things that someone else would have thought you would never do. It's because of a loss of priorities. We know the rest of the story of David. David ended up being a man that God said, this is a man after my heart. And, and, and there, there are several different uh, trains of thought there, a couple, basically, a man after my heart. I see it as David, though he messed up, he willingly confessed up because he longed for the heart of God. He never quit wanting God's heart. You see, that's the key to all of this. You know, you, you can mess up, church. You can do things you shouldn't do. You can lose your priorities. But the thing with David is he never let one of his loss dominate him. He always turned back to God. I could show you things about David that has blessed me tremendously down through the years. David even came to the place. Remember when Saul was out to kill him? Remember that? And David was given an opportunity to kill Saul. Okay, David literally could have come up and killed him. But David said, no, sir, I'm not touching him. I will not touch the anointed of God. I will not. Now, here, here we got Saul full of demons. But David did not disrespect the anointing that was placed upon Saul's life. Now, uh, <laughs> 
Okay, okay. I, I, I'm going to try not to go too much with that. But let me, let me give you a little red flag here. Your pastor, your preacher, your favorite prophet, your favorite apostle may mess up sometimes. They may do things they should not do. They may do things that aggravate you. But keep your lip off of God's anointing or you're going to end up in big, big trouble. Amen. I've never claimed to be perfect. I've never claimed that every decision I make is the right decision. But as long as I do it with the right heart, I'm in pretty good shape with God. Amen. As long as I do it with the right heart. So what I'm saying is David suffered all of this suffering simply because one day he said, I'm staying home. I'm staying home. When he should have been where God wanted him, he said, I'm staying home. What I'm saying to everyone here, I've given you a layout of, of where Jesus said, this is what I want you to seek. And basically laid out priorities. He said, I want you to seek my kingdom. Kingdom is basically, uh, if you syllabalize it, break it into two. What you come up with is king's domain. All right. He said, seek first the king's domain. And I went into that quite a bit last week, so I'm not going to go into it again. But for the next few minutes, I want you to see the Second part. Uh, all right, look at somebody say, first things first. I've laid out priorities. I've endeavored uh, uh, to teach this. It was not in my notes last week. The Holy Spirit added it to it this week and said, son, you need to zero in on and help people to know I have an order. I have a priority system. And if my church doesn't get my priority system, then they're not going to get my harvest. All right, all right. Now, notice this. He said, seek first the kingdom of God or the king's domain. And then he said, seek first uh, his righteousness. Everybody say, his righteousness. Now, the, 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 the subject of righteousness is becoming almost totally obsolete. You never, hardly ever hear a pastor preacher preach on righteousness anymore. It just doesn't happen. All right? But I want to tell you something. It, the only way you're going to go in the rapture is by being righteous. You're not going any other way. All right? You're not going to go because you're a praiser. You're not going to go because you're a tongue talker. You're not going to go because you pay your tithes and all of that you should do. The only people going to heaven are the righteous. Plain and simple. The Bible said without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. What is he saying? No man this, that is unrighteous. They're not going. Because righteousness, holiness, purification run synonymous together. All right? They all have great meaning. But they also are God laying out criteria. God laying out priorities. God said, you seek my kingdom. You know what? I could go into that for a moment, but I just want to give this to you. Remember when the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray? You remember that? And Jesus, being a rabbi, which means he was a teacher, said, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will. What is he doing? He's bringing the kingdom back to the spotlight. Seek the king's domain. Within the confines of the king's domain are righteous people. He, he tied the two together with a purpose. Righteous, righteous. Somebody said, there's no way I can be righteous. No, you can't. You cannot give up enough. You cannot quit wearing. You can't quit cussing. You can't quit doing this stuff enough to be worthy of his righteousness. That's where we got this thing mixed up. We think works is what uh, obligates God or what proves our right. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Okay, that's where the Pentecostal church has made a mistake for years is we, we preach that you do this, you do that, you do this, you do that. Then you're righteous. I'm sorry. It's not what I've done. It's what he's done that qualifies me for righteousness. It's his works, not my works that qualifies me for righteousness. Okay, 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 okay. Let me go, let me go. All right. The, 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 the word righteous is becoming obsolete. But yet we see here where righteousness is in a 50% partnership for us to be able to get all things. You see, everybody here wants the all things. These things shall be added. That's the message. We want the these things, but you got to understand the partnership. The partnership is kingdom, and righteousness. That's a 50-50 deal going there. 50% partnership. 
And so we understand that though we may make it obsolete, God is not making it obsolete. God made it a 50% partnership. He put righteousness in with kingdom. He made that as something that you see. Now notice this. Notice this. All right. Okay. You, you, will, you will not get the things added if you do not understand the need of both partners. If all you do is seek kingdom, and we went through the teaching of kingdom principles several years ago, and everybody's seeking kingdom. If all you do is seek kingdom, you're not going to get the full benefit of the partnership. He said, seek righteousness. And here we go. Here we go. All right. Understanding righteousness is something we all need. Simplistically, the definition of righteousness is right standing with God. Everybody say right standing with God. All right. We, got it. We, we must have right standing with God. The gift of righteousness gives you permanent, unconditional, irreversible, from first to last, right standing with God. In other words, once you get it, you got it. Say hallelujah. I said once you get it, you got it. In other words, you're righteous. You were righteous yesterday. You're righteous today. Okay, you have a right to dwell in that righteousness. But it means simply right standing with God. God. It means uh, that there is nothing between you and the Father. You have a clear, direct channel into God. All right? You need this. I need this. We need to understand this. Because there are people sitting here right now that you've got stuff between you and God. God has forgiven you of things and that you've not forgiven yourself of. God has let go of some stuff that you've not let go of. You're still holding on uh, to some actions or some deeds done uh, in your past. Okay, okay. If you didn't get that part, you'll get this part. Some people have no problem letting go what they've done, but you're letting what others have done stand between you and God. Righteousness is not having anything uh, stand between you and God. It's right standing. That means offending or being offended. That means hurting or being hurt. That means overcome or being an over. You, are you getting this? It doesn't matter what you were prior to your rebirth. Your rebirth uh, undone uh, your past. Uh, if you were a prostitute, if you were a drug addict, if you were a harlot, if you were a liar, it doesn't matter. All that has been washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ and he whom the Son has made free is now free indeed. Every now and then I, I, I say, God, this is what I'm hungry for. God, this is what I desire. And this little boy says, but don't you remember when, when? And then all of a sudden the winds shoot before me. If my flesh rules, the winds control. But when I roll back beyond, but devil, God forgot it. <laughs> God doesn't hold it against me. So guess what, devil? You can't either. And oh, sister bucket mouth can't either. It doesn't matter what you think about me. It doesn't matter what you say about me. You might have known me when. What you need to do is overcome what I was and start seeing me as I am. <laughs> but guess what? I'm a son of God. I'm a joint heir. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I'm not a servant of sin any longer, okay? I am blood bought, blood covered. I'm an heir of God. I'm even a joint heir with Jesus Christ. In other words, we are co equal in ownership. Not only that, but get this this one that you say you're serving and this one that you say you're loving, guess what he told me? He said, Don't worry about it. All things I've done, son, you can. 
can do also, but I'm going to add to that. You can even do greater than what I've done. How can I do greater than what he did? I'll tell you why. Because he sits at the right hand of heaven representing me and anything I call on, uh, he turns to the Father and says, that's one of ours. Uh, That's one of ours. Uh, Do what he says uh, because I bought it. Uh, I paid for it. I made him an overcomer. I made him a son of God. Uh, He has a right. Give the Lord a hand clap right now. The channel is clear. It's clear between me and heaven. Some people pray this prayer and I've had them to come up to me and say, Pastor, I prayed but it felt like the heavens were brass. That's a lie. That is a lie. You are righteous. You you have a clear channel right into heaven. I taught and I'm going to preach a whole message on it, but I was teaching in school of ministry the other night of how that we're conduits of glory. We're conduits from God through us to others. That's the way God really wanted it to be. My mind was on that for just a few moments yesterday and I got to thinking, and I I say this in conferences where I'm teaching or preaching, and I tell people where the Holy Spirit spoke to me many years ago and said, tell people, you're you're, you're not a reservoir. All right. You're not, you're not created to hold me. You're a dispenser. You're created to release me. Glory, glory. And, and that's what he said to me. But then I got to thinking. <laughs> Dispensers contain ready to pour. All right. And as long as we're releasing what God has poured in, we're making room for more of God. Isn't that good? So that's what God's wanting to do. And righteousness is what brings us to that, okay? Right standing, nothing. Everybody say nothing can separate us. That, that's what it means, right standing. is nothing separating us. Does the father have any problems with the son? Of course not. Is there any conflict between the father and son? Of course not. Does the father point out the son's fault? Nope, nope. You are in Christ through what happened at the cross. You are one with the Father. So actually, every second of every moment of every day, you are actually as close to the Father as Jesus is. Isn't that powerful? Okay, now, here's our priorities. Kingdom and righteousness. Those two things we should seek after more than anything else. We really should. Those two things. And then he said, and then these things shall be added. Don't seek things until you seek kingdom and righteousness. As a matter of fact, and this has been proven in my life over and over, if I seek kingdom and righteousness, the things just come automatically. I've never starved to death preaching the gospel, okay? I never have. Now, I'm not always eating the best in my mind, but I've never starved to death. I've never had to say, okay, God, if you don't do something, I'm dying. Uh Uh-uh, no, no, no. I've been assaulted by the devil. I've been assaulted by evil. But never has God ever turned his back. So what I'm saying, and I'm not saying, look at me. I'm saying there's a priority system for your family to be blessed. There's a priority system for everything to come that needs to come in your life. If we miss the priorities, we bring death, destruction, demonic control. We bring all of this stuff into our house. But the devil's not doing it to us. We're doing it to ourselves because we chose to rewrite the word. We chose to do it my way. God won't accept that. He's made Christianity the easiest thing to abide in as there ever was. It's not hard being a child of God. It's not hard praying. It's not hard studying your word. All of those are nothing but justifications for the failures of our carnality. It's not hard. None of it's hard. All we've got to do is submit to him. Just submit to him. Everybody stand all over the building. Give the Lord a great big hand clap right now, will you? Give him a hand clap. 